Hello, everyone. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Paul Fashone, the CEO of Fashone Instruments. It's great to have all of you participate in our first virtual product launch. Under normal circumstances, we would be introducing the Tryon Mill at the M&M meeting in Milwaukee next week with a close follow-up at the EMC meeting in Copenhagen later in August. However, and as all of you know, these are anything but normal circumstances. The good news is we continue to be healthy, and I hope that the same is true for you and yours. I have to say it is a bit strange to be thinking about not going to the airport tomorrow morning. This will break 34 consecutive years of participation in M&M. Ideally, the coronavirus situation improves because we're looking forward to hosting all of you in Pittsburgh next year at M&M. As you'll see from the upcoming presentation, Fashone Instruments has continued its tradition of innovation in ion milling. The company introduced its first ion mill in 1992 for TEM applications. About 10 years ago, we leveraged everything that we knew in terms of TEM and put it into our first ion milling system for SEM applications, and that was the Model 1060. About three years ago, we used the 1060 as the basis, again, taking everything that we learned through its participation and incorporated those features into the Model 1061 SEM mill. The 1061 is achieving exceptional performance and is serving a very important market niche. Through our experiences with the 1061, we saw a significant market potential that was not being satisfied, and that is large flat scale milling. For the past two years, our team has worked incredibly hard to deliver a solution and I think that you're going to be very excited about what you're about to see. This is the Model 1062 Tryon Mill. It is a fully automated tabletop argon ion milling system that features highly flexible milling parameter adjustment. It offers large-scale milling in both planar and cross-section samples and creates the largest and most uniform flat area achievable by, by ion milling with samples up to 50 millimeters that are effectively processed utilizing three ion sources. In addition to those characteristics, it provides the ultimate workflow for environmentally sensitive materials. The ion sources utilized in the Tryon mill are three independently adjustable true focus ion sources, the same technology that we're utilizing in our other ion milling systems. The energy range is variable from 100 EV for gentle polishing up to 10 kV for rapid material removal. The beam current density is high up to 10 milliamps per square centimeter, and the milling angle range is adjustable from zero to 10 degrees, utilizing motorized ion source angular adjustment with each of the three sources being at the same angle. Faraday cups are utilized for the direct measurement of beam current. This allows the ion source parameters to be optimized for specific applications. Additional key features is the ability of adjusting the spot size anywhere from about 300 microns up to five millimeters. High milling rates combined with low ion source maintenance make this an ideal instrument. This slide shows the relative position of the ion sources and ion beams. And this essentially is the secret sauce of the instrument. 
If you look at the beams in the upper position, you can see them aligned so that they cross at the center point, which is the axis of rotation. In the lower image, the beams are configured sort of in a bird foot type of configuration, and that allows the ions to project all the way out to the periphery of the sample. That's what produces the large milling area, and that's something that Pavel will be talking on in a little bit. The try-on mill features a front loading load lock, and this is an ideal situation for high throughput sample flow. A pneumatic gate valve separates the load lock from the instrument chamber, which is always under vacuum. With this system, we have a quick release quarter turn bayonet located on the end of the tra transfer rod, which allows for easy engagement and disengagement of the sample holder. On the left, you can see the transfer rod in the loading or unloading position. When it's not being utilized, it folds down out of the way. The sample stage is capable of accepting both planar and cross-section samples. In the planar mode, the maximum size is 50 millimeters in diameter by 25 millimeters high. And in cross-section mode, it goes up to 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters by 4 millimeters. As with what we've done with many of our ion milling systems, the try-on mill features automatic sample height detection to establish the milling plane, and this adds to very repeatable results. Sample motion is either with full 360 degree rotation or rocking with variable speed, depending on the material characteristics and your desires for the specimen preparation. Instrument programming is through a touch screen. This is a 10 inch ergonomically adjustable screen where you're able to utilize and enter any of the operating parameters. Optional features, we've found that many samples are temperature sensitive. With this, there is an integral liquid nitrogen conductive cooling doer with automatic temperature interlocks. You have the ability to program and maintain a specific temperature somewhere between atmosphere and cryogenic. We purposefully positioned the doer access point to be close to the front of the instrument so it can be easily filled. And once filled, it provides up to 18, hour, 18 hours of cryo conditions. There are interlocks in the system that if the stage temperature rises above a selected threshold, the process automatically terminates, which is very important if you're doing a run overnight when the laboratory is not being occupied. The cross-section station produces pristine cross-section samples by allowing the precise positioning of the area of interest in X, Y, and theta, or rotate. It's effective for a wide variety of materials. We have a lot of experience on semiconductor devices, multi-layers, ceramics, even polymers in terms of the soft materials, as well as hard, brittle materials. The prepared region is flat, and it's free of damage for subsequent SEM imaging and analysis. The cross-section station accommodates a wide range of sample and mass sizes, and you're able to achieve multiple uses from a single mask. Another key characteristic of the try-on mill is the ability of transferring from a glove box or another vacuum chamber under vacuum in either inner gas or cryogenic. 
we've been doing this development and collaboration with Quorum Technologies in the UK. And if you see my cursor on the right, this is the interface on the front of the Tryon mill. Behind there is the load lock gate valve, which separates the chamber. The sample is located. There is a door on the front of the transfer system, which closes, allowing the sample to be contained in the vacuum or inert gas environment. A liquid nitrogen dewer flask maintains the temperature if you so desire during the transfer process. And there is a small ion getter pump that's battery operated that connects to the chamber that allows vacuum, active vacuum pumping while the sample is being transferred from the try-on mill to the SEM or focused ion beam system. There's a magnetically coupled transfer rod which transfers the sample from the capsule into either the try-on mill or the SEM FIB. Additional options include in situ viewing with high mag magnification capabilities. And there's a choice of one of two microscopes, either 525X or 1960X. Located directly beneath the viewing window is a shutter that can be programmed. That prevents the buildup of sputtered material and preserves the ability to observe the sample in situ for prolonged periods of time. Image acquisition can be captured by a CMOS camera. The secondary monitor is particularly useful at being able to image the sample, and the image can be saved to a dedicated computer or transferred to another computer. Remote operation is something that we feel has been increasingly important, particularly in this day where many laboratories are shut down. The remote operation of the try-on mill allows for recipe programming, starting, pausing, stopping the milling process, monitoring the progress via the microscope options, taking snapshots when they're desired, and also monitoring all of the important instrument functional parameters such as chamber pressure vacuum level and sample temperature there's also a service diagnostics component that allows the fashion service team to access the instrument for diagnostic purposes now in terms of applications i will turn this over to dr pavel nowakowski our application scientist who will go through the applications that we've done so far with the Tryon mill. Thank you, Paul. Welcome, everybody. I'm extremely happy to be with you today uh, <clears throat> and having you with us. Um, I will share with you some results obtained using our new model 1062 Tryon mill, uh, the most robust, versatile sample preparation system for SEM applications. So let's see what we can do um, using our model 1062. The first application the first application I will start is semiconductor targeted delayering. De so you can see here it's sample after the process we use uh, for that purpose um, uh, three beams uh, crossing in the center of the stage. As you can see here, this is milled area. And why targeting the layering? Because we target one of the layer. In, in that example, it's a copper. As you can see here from MIDI-SD da data, we go through um, this uh, passivation layer, then first aluminum metal layer, and we stop exactly at the copper line. So now the question will be, how uniform is that the layering? And <clears throat> how clean it is. So if you zoom into the, uh, any of place of that um, 
area here, which is about four, uh, 400 microns. In diameter, you will see that it's extremely clean and you can easily distinguish the microstructure of copper. Another question is how uniform is that delirinine? So we cut, uh, we did um, a cross section, fib cross section in the center, and one in the extreme of the uh, meaning area, as you can see here, the cross section, one in the center, and another one, 150 microns from the center. So you can see the cross section are very uniform, very similar, and if you look closer, you will find the uniformity of the meaning is uh, 50 nanometers over 300 microns. So it's very nice and clean, the target delaying process. So now we'll, um, we'll go to the large area um, meeting, but before a few words, why we show a lot of, we will show a lot of EBSD results. So we use EBSD technique to assess sample preparation uh, quality. As you know, the EBSD technique is very sensitive for any sample preparation artifacts, like scratches, as you can see here, um, induce um, deformation on induce um, phase change. So we use EBSD technique to see how good our sample preparation is. As you can see here on that example, the initial phase uh, of ion milling, we still see some scratches from from mechanical polishing and induce deformation. While we mill, we remove the scratches, we remove the deformation, and post milling image show a native structure of the analyzed material. So that is the reason that we will show a lot of EBSD data. So then I will move to the cross-section preparation. It's very demanding application, um, for instance, for um, failure analysis. And here we have the um, solder bomb cross-section. This sample was not, not at all mechanical polish, just the mask will pause a line at the center of the solder bombs, uh, all material above the mask was removed by one cut using um, trion mill. As you can see here on that image, we have um, perfect cross section about five millimeters width um, of 12 solder bombs, and you can zoom at any area on that cross section and do failure analysis. As you can see here, you can clearly distinguish the microstructure of uh, solder and the interface is very clean between the solder and the copper pad. You can, of course, do any analytical uh, measurement that you wish for your failure analysis, identify all the phases present um, in your uh, solder bombs, and of course, you can do EBSD that will show the very excellent uh, quality data EBSD obtained from any of the 12 solder bombs present here. As you can see, you can study the phase distribution on crystallographic uh, relationship between them. So the next example is austenitic steel. Uh, you can see here the sample that is 18 by 18 millimeters. So we milled it by um, ion mill and collected the images from whole area, then stitched them together. So as you can see here, if you zoom at any place of that sample, that big sample, you will see that the structure is very uniform. You can see um, very easily the austenitic steel structure distinguish all the grains and see that the meaning was uniform across all the samples from the center to any corner or edge of that sample. Another example is very interesting, um, multi-phases mineralogical sample which has some porosity which makes it very difficult to preparing for any sample preparation technique. This sample has dimension of 25 by 20 millimeters and it made uh, basically um, from corundum grind, grains, which are these big grains here, surrounded by um, anorhyte, mostly by anorhyte. As you can see, we obtained a very high, a good quality EBSD pattern across whole um, surface of the sample, which is quite big. So this is showing the 
EBSD pattern here or uh, band contrast uh, mapping uh, overlay of the sample. This sample is very challenging for analysis also for that reason that the grains are very change the size from a millimetric size for corundum up to tens of microns from um, for anorhyte and orthoclase. Another example is martensitic steel. Here you see the sample dimension 28 by 10 millimeters of martensite. As you can see here, the image forward scatter electron contrast which showing very sharp crystallographic contrast. As you can see here, the lots of martensite and that also show that uh, the topography, surface topography after all, all ion meaning is very shallow to, because this is very important if you want to get such beautiful images like this one. Another slide is showing the corresponding EBSD map was acquired at quite high speed and and quite high binning. As you can see here, we got very nice and uh, high quality EBSD data obtained from whole big area, almost 30 millimeters width sample. And if this is still not enough for you and you want to uh, or you need to polish bigger samples, bigger area, you can easily polish the sample is up to 500, 50 millimeters diameter in area. As you can see here, we have an example of the copper bar, 48 millimeters by 12 millimeters. As you can see here, there's log log of model um, 1062 with the sample sitting on the stop after milling process. So once again, we collected a lot of images SEM images in BSD data for whole area of that sample. So you can see here, there is example the, of images collected on the, in the center yeah, at the edge. If you zoom to the images, you will see as it's extremely clean and uniform meaning uh, over whole area. And you can easily distinguish the microstructure of the copper. If you go to the one of the corner or edge of the sample, you will see the same high quality meaning X, which, X, which show you microstructure of the copper. So we collected, of course, EBSD data to show you that the surface quality is very good. This map showing the center of the meaning and another IPF map showing the uh, left bo uh, right bottom corner which is 24 millimeters from the center. As you can see, there is the EBSD data at the same quality as for the center, as for the periphery of the sample. So the question now is um, what you can get from so huge amount of data that you will be collected from the huge sample like that 50 millimeters width. So you can get you, you can improve your statistical measurements like grain size or texture. And here is example of um, grain um, average grain size that we calculated for our copper bar, which is 250 microns. It was calculated from uh, 6,000 grains. As you can see here, this is only from calculated from small fraction of the sample. So you can imagine how good statistic you will get. Um, being able to mill big sample such big like 50 millimeters in diameter. Another slide is showing set of pole figure that was plotted um, from five million five million data points showing very strong texture along 111 direction for our copper bar. With that uh, conclusion I will turn over uh, to Paul. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Pavel. I'd like to express my appreciation of Pavel and the entire applications team for those very compelling results. I think that we're very confident that we've clearly established the ability to mill out to large areas up to 50 millimeters. 
I'd also like to thank Mary Ray for her hard work in putting together this webinar and also for generating all the support material for the Tryon Mill. I'd now like to open this up for discussion. If you have questions to ask, I suggest that you type them into the appropriate area on the webinar bar. The first question that's come in is how often do we need to change the mask? Um, that's not a real straightforward answer because it depends a lot on what you're trying to do. First of all, it's dependent on the sample thickness. If the sample is thicker, the ion beam is engaged for a longer period, it takes you additional time. It also depends on the area of interest. If you're looking for a couple of hundred square microns, the ion beam is not engaged for a great extent of time, the usage of the mask goes up. With this, you also have the ability of traversing the mask with respect to the ion beam, so you can get multiple uses per edge of the mask and the mask also has the ability to be rotated so you can utilize the various edges on each side of the mask surface. Uh, in some cases, mask usage can be 20, 50 times. Again, it depends on on the requirements of the sample. A second question is I would like to know the time scale with spot size. If I understand the question correctly, it relates to milling time versus spot size. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, we can reduce the spot size down to about 300 microns. If you utilize all three ion sources crossed at the center point of rotation, you can get incredibly high milling rates in either planar or cross section, upwards of 500 microns to a millimeter an hour if you desire to go that high. Naturally, if you defocus, and this is one of the examples of the true focus, if you're able to defocus the beam or when you defocus the beam and go to that bird foot type of configuration, you're spreading the dosage over a lot, air, lot larger area and that'll obviously reduce the uh, milling rate. It's also dependent upon the sample material. Copper sputters very easily, tungsten does not. Additional questions are coming in. Um, have you tried nanostructured samples with the Tryon mill? Pavel? Oh. So I can I think they take that one. Uh, it depends how you define an, um, a nanostructure. Um, if you look at the example that we presented uh, from Martin Zitic Steel, this is kind of nanostructure. The grains are very, very small. Um, and I used uh, for mapping that, I use 100 na na nanometer step size, and it's still too big. I will have to, if map, map this well, I will have to use 60 nanometer step size. So, yes, we, we, we did nanostructure, and the results are exactly the same from nanometric grains, micro. Uh, scale grains of nanometric grains. Next question, Cecile. What are some run times for something like planar IC samples or cross sections? Uh, I hate to keep using the word depend but it actually does depend on what you're trying to do. We've had some run times down as little as 30 seconds to two or three minutes. Those are cases where you can do a cleave, a mechanical polish, follow it up by the ion mill. If you're doing it in cross section, you know, typical wafer thickness, 
uh, anywhere from a few minutes up to about an hour, you can achieve the effective results, uh, depending upon the area. Can you talk to the general throughput of this mill as a function of cut length if I wanted to mill 50 microns deep of material? Pavel, can you take that one, please? I don't know if uh, I understand well, but if you want to sequently mill and remove uh, 50 microns, from the sample, that will be relatively fast. What is, next question, what is the size of the target shown on one of the first slides where the beam is not centered? Is it 50 millimeter diameter or less? Um, Let me go back to that slide. I believe that this is the slide that you're talking about. If you look at the periphery of the sample, this is 50 millimeters across. In this particular case, we were operating the ion beams at 6 kV with a three degree beam angle. And the sources were defocused so that the spot size of the source, where it crosses either the axis of rotation or the bright spot of the beam in the lower image at about three millimeters. And again, to reiterate, you can go from 300 microns, you know, a sharp pencil, all the way up to the five millimeters. So you have a lot of options and a lot of flexibilities for adjusting the parameters of the ion source, as well as their positioning. That's really the key is the flexibility of varying these parameters to produce the ideal results that uh, Pavel's demonstrated. Uh, was there a question about that? Okay, what is required to switch the system from planar polishing to cross-section and vice versa? That is a, um, it's a great question and it's extremely easy to do. In our methodology, we've decided to take a lot of the cumbersome activities of sample alignment outside of the vacuum. And in this case, for planar specimens, you can basically put the sample onto the mount, put it in the shuttle, transfer it into the milling chamber. For cross sections, it follows exactly the same methodology. You do your preparation, in your alignment with the cross-section station. Again, capture that into the shuttle and transfer it into the ion mill. So it's extremely easy to go from a cross-section to a planar sample. And that's another key advantage of the automatic height detection. There's a laser and photo detector so that when the sample is inserted, the instrument goes through a sequencing operation to seek that top surface of the sample, and that pertains to both the flat and the cross sections. Once it does that, then the automated functionality of the instrument takes over in terms of milling, angle, and beam characteristics. There's a question on approximate cost of the base system. We will defer all costing. Um, if you would like, please email us at sales at and we'll be happy to provide the costing information to you. Can you talk much more about aligning the mask on the sample and how much skill is needed to hit 
a line of 30 micron targets within one to two microns of the center. Pavel, can you take that one, please? Um, not uh, at all skill is needed. Um, I think after maybe uh, w watching our training video and trying once, you will get them uh, there. Um, as long as, as you can see your 30 millimeters uh, target, 30 micrometers uh, target, you will be able to do it very easily. Is there a special feature that could help with the backside milling of a fib sample? That's an interesting question. Um, I guess I have to know a little bit more about the application. You know, typically a fib lamella is on the order of a few to tens of microns. Uh, further thinning a fib lamella, at least in our opinion, is a function more suited for a nanomill or a picomill where you have a spot size that's smaller than the lamella itself, which allows you to remove the implantation amorphous damage without creating the redeposition. We would need to experiment with that um, because you would be showering it with a relatively large beam onto a relatively small lamella. Another question, a very interesting and exciting system. Well, thank you very much for that. These are anonymous. So I don't know who said that, but thank you for that. Is it possible to use a current Fashion inner sample shuttle use one with a 1040 with this system or only the new one with the nanomill there is a 50 millimeter diameter vat gate valve located behind the load lock and transfer rod with the trion mill in order to accommodate the larger sample size because the desire to be competitive with this was to go up to the 50 millimeters in diameter by 25 millimeters high. Because of that, it was necessary to utilize an 80 millimeter VAT gate valve. So in that case, the answer to the question would be no, it would not be transferable from one to the other. Now we are thinking about the possibility of utilizing the quorum vacuum capsule on some of the other instrumentation, but that's um, that's out of the scope of this project. Can the milling center be positioned at a specific site on the sample and how accurate? Ideally, you would like to have the area of interest on the axis of rotation. That's done external and that's a very easy alignment. It can be done optically, it can be done under a light optical microscope. In addition to that, the ion source positions can be adjusted external to the system. There are adjustment mechanisms within the ion source knobs that allow you to go from this crossed configuration to the bird foot. And you do that by having a glass cover slide in place of the sample. The glass fluoresces very nicely under the presence of the argon ion beam. And you're able to position the ion sources while they're energized in situ while you're observing their position on the viewing screen from the, uh, the microscope and camera. Do we need fine polished sample before putting for flat milling? <laughs> yes and no. It's always been our philosophy that 
with specimen preparation, you should take ideal care at every step in the process. And certainly if you're doing the mechanical grinding with three micron abrasive, you're going to have a more coarse structure than if you do it with one micron abrasive. What that does, it cuts down on the milling time. So it's just a question of how much time you would spend with the mechanical preparation or how much time would be tolerable in the ion mill. But yes, we have been very successful finishing a three micron diamond, putting it in a trion mill and being able to push the flat area all the way out to the 50 millimeter diameter periphery. Have you measured the surface roughness after milling? What is the best performance? The answer to that is yes. And depending on the sample and depending on the area of interest, we've been able to get that flatness down to about 50 nanometers. Is the current maintained or does it fluctuate? Can you have a steady and stable etch rate? From run to run, the current is stable. And what you can typically do is measure that with the Faraday cup so you have, and you can do this at the beginning and at the end of the process. So you have a starting point and a finishing point because the, um, the intention is sample to sample consistency. Do you have a copy of the presentation that you can share? Yes, we can make this available as this video will also be available. Can the stage rotate during the milling process? Absolutely. The modes of operation are either full 360 degree rotation and the speed can be variable from just a fraction of a revolution per minute up to 10 RPM. You also have the ability for cross-section samples of rocking, and you can set the rocking angle at any degree from one to 179. So yes, it can be fully rotated and the sample can be rocked. Again, we are getting um, questions relative to cost and maintenance cost on this. Again, we'll defer those. Uh, please email us directly at sales at fishone.com. A question, how would you perform a backside milling of a 25 micron by 15 micron fib lamella? The short answer is I would utilize either our nano mill or our pico mill. What is the minimum sample thickness in case sample is tapered or slanted? Um, I'll ask Pavel to weigh in on this, but I'll make my first attempt at it. What I would do would be put maybe the average thickness on the axis of rotation, and at that point, you could accommodate sample thicknesses down to just a few microns. Pavel, could you further on that, please? Yeah, I think your idea is, is correct. The thickness more to the center to utilize the thickness afterwards. Will this Decker recording be available? Yes, yes, it definitely will be. Can reactive gases be used with or instead of argon? At this point, the answer would be no. Uh, we've done the work exclusively with argon. We've also contemplated the use of xenon. Uh, it's something that we get a lot of requests until people recognize the cost of the xenon. Pablo, question, how much time for an ion mill of 50 millimeter square area? 
Uh, that will be depending on the material that that, that you want to mill, uh, how you will finish it by mechanical polishing, three micron, six micron, one micron down polish, uh, um, what angle will you will use, what, what beam size, um, it once again is depending of um, what voltage you will use, what, uh, beam current, it's a lot of flexibility if our system, so you can vary all that parameters and then get longer or shorter milling time. A question, did you observe any redeposition when sample is milled for long hours? Uh, we have put samples in this for a pretty considerable amount of time and we've been pleasantly surprised and I think Pavel's results evidence the fact that we're only seeing the native material all the way out to the periphery. And that's a combination of the beam configuration and also the ability of rotation. It sweeps the redeposited material from the surface. And naturally, it's, there's a the dependency of um, accelerating voltage. Does the optional cross-section station need to be removed prior to planar polishing? If so, what is required to install and remove the cross-section station? This is the beauty of the system, and this goes back to the Model 1060 and Model 1061. The cross-section station that I believe I have up on my screen is totally outside of the vacuum. The only thing that's in the instrument vacuum is the sample itself. And in this case, you can't really, well, you can't see it because it's not there, but this set screw captures the mask. The sample is contained in this area shown by my cursor. And then you have the micrometer adjustments that you can orient the mask in relation to the sample. This micrometer allows for the rotation of the base. So this gives you X, Y, and theta movement. This is all done external to the instrument. And the nice thing about that is you can be processing one sample while you're loading a second one in the cross-section station. Are the sources the same as on the 1060 as far as maintenance and servicing? Uh, the answer is no. The 1061, the 1062 utilize the next generation true focus sources. Uh, when we started the 1061 development, the, one of the first things we did was looked at the ion source technology. And we've made considerable improvements to the ion optics to the point that the true focus sources now are operating in excess of 95% efficiency. So we've made improvements, and not only does that increase the milling rate, it also increases the duration in between maintenance. Thanks a lot, Paul. You're quite welcome. Uh, great system, impressive results. Good job, Paul, for such large areas. Uh, like the cryo inert gas transfer system to that is is going to be game changing technology. We're getting many many requests in for samples that are just extremely environmentally sensitive, with battery materials being at the forefront, and some of these materials and there's different types of lithium and we're finding that some are more reactive than others. Some you just basically look at the wrong way and they oxidize. And this is where we feel that we're going to have a huge competitive advantage of being able to go from the glove box to the ion mill. And then from the ion mill directly into either the SEM or the focused ion beam system to extract the area of interest, ideally the TEM lamella, and then go into a device like the Pico mill or directly into the TEM. And I'll touch on, and that was one of the reasons why we did the collaboration with Quorum. They've been a great partner. They've been in this business for many years, and they have all the port information for the SEMs and the focused ion beam systems. 
So that's giving us a huge advantage in having the ability of transferring these very sensitive materials under either vacuum, inert gas, cryo temperatures, while you're actively vacuum pumping on the capsule. It's just, like I said, it's going to be a game changer. Well, that was the last question. Oh, there's one more coming in. One more question about the slide with the beams not in the center. Is that the maximum decentering possible? Have you ever noticed any artifacts related to a single milling direction for a particular far from center point? Yes, uh, there's no question about it. There's a lot that goes into that. It's not only the position, it's also the angle, the spot size, and the sample. Uh, and we're doing considerable experimentation for different configuration or beam positions. Those were just two of the more common examples that we've shown. And in certain circumstances, you can produce a donut type of configuration where one area is milling uh, more rapidly or more slowly than, the, slowly than the other. And this, you know, quite frankly, is going to take some time to develop. What we did is we put the ultimate flexibility into the ion beam positioning control, and that allows us to do the subsequent uh, experimentation to get those ideal results that are very much material and sample and usage dependent. How could you monitor the thinness of the lamella as it is being milled and know when to stop before perforating ROI, region of interest? I take it that the way that question is being asked, it's more a function of a TEM application, whereas the Tryon mill is more an application of SEM. Now, how I would answer that for a TEM application would be utilize the Model 1080 Pico mill. In that device, in addition to the secondary imaging with the ions, you also have an electron column and the ability of using both stem and backscatter to observe the lamella shrinkage in situ. And as the thickness changes, the contrast changes, and that's particularly determined by the stem signal. So for thinning the fib lamella, the nano mill without the SEM column or the pico mill with the SEM column is, those two are certainly the ones of choice. Okay, thanks, but can I move those not in center beam, even more to the side. The three ion beams are located within 100 degrees. So you have the central beam at zero and the left and right ion sources separated by 50 degrees for the 100 degree included angle. Yes, you can move the center off to the side off axis. Naturally, that one will not go all the way out to the peripheral like the ones on the right and left, but there's no reason that the center beam needs to be focused at the axis of rotation. That's one of the key flexibility aspects of this system. I will keep this open for another minute or so. All of the questions seem to have stopped. Naturally, after the fact, if anything comes up, if you'd like additional information, uh, feel free to contact us. We can set up a phone call. We can set up a, a, a webinar. We can work on your particular materials. Uh, this is an exciting new development for us. I really appreciate everybody's interest here today and hopefully look forward to working with at least some of you to get this system into your laboratory. So thanks again, everybody. I hope that you stay healthy and stay safe, and hopefully we'll see each other next year in Pittsburgh. Take care.